Hi, all. Dr. Clark here again. Uh, today for animal biology, we're going to talk about animal systematics. So we're going to talk about the use of things like phylogenetic trees and cladograms to link ancestral connections. So here's an example of examining, you know, kind of the dinosaur, reptile, mammal, bird linkage, and um, and then the traits that separate these groups out. Uh, the fact that you know when we start looking at aves and we look at their link to dinosaurs, you know, we know that some dinosaurs had feathers and some did not. So that's going to branch off. I, prior to that, and then the feather line of dinosaurs is going to split again. All feathered dinosaurs had teeth, but no aves, no birds have teeth, so no teeth. Okay, and there's lots of different ways to uh, construct phylogenetic trees or cladograms. Uh, some of them use just physical characteristics. The more robust ones are going to use genetic connections, so how many genetic differences there might be. And then the very robust ones would use something like morphology, so a physical characteristic, the genes that differ, and then the time period, so how many millions of years have they been separated. And so you might see uh, throughout the semester, you'll see me use different phylogenetic trees or cladograms um, to demonstrate connections between ancestral species. In some cases, it's connections between species that are still in existence today. And then in other cases, it'll be connections with um, ancient species or extinct species uh, in the different categories. Okay? And they're useful because it really shows an evolutionary trend. There are features that we can see, and when we dissect and examine different organisms, we can see some features, how they have evolved or adapted into a new, um, having a new mechanism or a new purpose in, in the next organism. Okay? So it might not go away, but it might, the functionality might change, or the amount of projections or the amount of surface area they take up might change uh, as you progress up the evolutionary tree. All right, so. To begin with, let's start talking about a little bit about taxonomy or systematics. The purpose is really to um, basically document the diversity of organisms on the planet. Okay? And it's very ancient. Um, Linnaeus okay, really kind of started the classification system with kingdom, phylum, class, etc. But even before him, a lot of scientists were uh, trying to catalog the species on the planet. Okay? And we still do that today. But now, you know, with every advancement in science, our toolbox okay, keeps getting more and more advanced. And we get more and more tools in the toolbox. Now, that could be a good thing, and that could be a confusing thing. So when Linnaeus was around and came up with the classification system, he was basing everything on morphology, so physical features of the organism. Later, physiology started to come into play along with morphology, along with the ability to reproduce together, these kind of things. That's making up the biological species concept. And then once genetics became uh, more useful to use and less expensive, and even today, in some cases, it's too expensive, okay? but it's getting cheaper day by day. Um, you'll start to see that genetics is, is the, the tool in the toolbox that is most often used to classify and show ta taxonomic connections. Okay? But really, systematics or taxonomy is, is just examining the different organisms on the planet and their evolutionary relationships. So a couple words that you might hear, a couple terminology, pieces of terminology that you'll hear in other lectures um, or in readings and things like that. Taxon just refers to a group of animals that share a particular set of characteristics. Now, if the taxon was described 
a long time ago, maybe the characteristics that they share are purely morphology. If the taxon was described more recently, maybe the characteristics they share is just genetics, and there is no morphological difference. And so it's really kind of depending on you know what era the taxon was was most recently described. In some cases, like when I'm talking about uh, a group of organisms, I might say this taxon or taxonomic uh, linkage or taxonomic classification needs to be uh, revisited. Now, what I mean by that often is there's some holes in that taxon. Um, maybe some species belong to that taxon that are not in that taxon, or vice versa. Maybe some that are in the taxon need to be removed. And morphologically, maybe they fit, but through evolutionary uh, point of view or genetic point of view, maybe they don't need to be in that taxon. Maybe those taxons need to be separated. And we'll look at this as we progress. Okay, Taxonomic categories, um, this is just the way that we arrange uh, different groups of organisms. And so we range them from being very broad, having a few characteristics that are similar, to very specific, having all the characteristics that are similar. Okay? And, you know, this is the current, probably the most current and most useful taxonomic categories. Um, domains, currently there are three that are recognized. Kingdoms, most people um, are going with six kingdoms. However, there are some entities that think that there should be eight kingdoms. Um, Phyla, there's lots. Uh, class, order, family, genus, species, etc. Um, so I'll just let you know that this could change in your lifetime. I mean, it changed in my lifetime when, when I first took an animal biology class. Uh, there was no such thing as domains. Um, so we just had kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, so if you need an, you know, a way to remember this, you know. I learned it as King Philip came over from German seas, okay? Because when I learned it, there was no D. Uh, I just stuck dude on it. Um, you can do whatever you want. You can come up with a, with a whatever you want. And if you don't need it, then it's not needed. Um, but this is the way I kind of I remembered it when I was young. Now, a couple key things that we'll talk about is really above the species level. Now remember we talked about the biological species concept and the phylogenetic species concept. There, there are definitions of what a species is or what a species are um, and, uh, and it's fairly well def defined but above that what a genus is is you know we have a way to kind of lump things together and we know that based on some physical features or some molecular features that they should be in this genera. Okay? But the actual definition of what the genera is, there's really no good definition. Family, order, etc., etc. I mean, we know that right now we recognize six kingdoms. Most people do. And we know to be in the animal kingdom, you need to be a heterotroph and you need to have animal cells. Um, you need to be multicellular, uh, except for there are potentially single cellular animals. Um, so the kingdom thing is probably a little bit better definition of what you need to have, what features you need to have to fit in that kingdom, but what a kingdom is is, is kind of difficult. So again, like I said, this will probably change in your lifetime. Right? Even the species category will probably change in your lifetime. What's recognized as a species and not as a species and I could see in the future maybe even adding at the end of this instead of having species maybe and it maybe we actually have ecotype or some other thing that that shows the ecological region at which that species comes from and that might be more important uh, than species because we know that there's lots of species that can occur lots of places in the world and 
and that's fine, but we know that there's some of those individuals in that in, in that species of that species occupy very specific regions. And they always occupy that very specific region. And it's important for them to be in that region because they might be a keystone species or they might be very important for the ecosystem. Um, so they could get a eco tag or something like that um, where you know we recognize that all that organism is the same species, but the ecotype is very important. Okay, so I could see that being added, especially when genetics becomes so easy to use that really the the ability to classify something to a species will be as simple as you know handheld sequencers where you just take a blood or saliva or skin sample, put it on there, and and it gives it to you in the field, you know, w whenever you want in a matter of minutes. Um, that technology is, is coming. It, it's really expensive right now, but it's coming. It, it will be here, and I think that will be a way in which for people to say, well, okay, we already know these are the same species, but is there something special about this? Does it need to be its own ecotype or something, some other kind of term for that organism? Um, to denote that, hey, it's only found in this region. Okay. All right. We'll see. You'll see um, in your future. Okay. So, again, taxonomic categories, uh, we've kind of talked about this before. Uh, when we're talking in animal biology, we're going to be dealing with eukarya. Um, so, eukaryotes, remember, they have true nuclei and, and membrane bound organelles. Okay, so that's what fits them into that kind of domain. All Animalia have that. Okay, the kingdom Animalia, um, you know, that's what we're going to be mainly concentrating on in this course, although we will spend some time with the kingdom Protista because they gave rise to animals or most likely gave rise to animal-like creatures. So it's important to kind of hit the ancestors to Animalia. The rest of these will change. It depends on the phyla that we're talking about. We're not always going to talk about organisms with backbones and mammals and things like that. So, um, nonetheless, uh, this is kind of important for you to know how to rank organisms um, based on the taxon that they belong to. Yeah. All right, nomenclature. We kind of talked about this already. The binomial system. Okay, the two naming system, genera species, okay, genus is capitalized, species is lowercase. If you're handwriting it, it needs to be underlined. If you type it out, it needs to be in italics. Okay. Now, we'll talk a little bit about how to name organisms. There is an international code, zoological nomenclature. Now, it depends on the group, the class at which the organism um, exists in. Some international codes for zoological nomenclature are better than others. For example, um, when we talk about common names, and sometimes people will call things by their common name, um, for the most part, the common name in most groups of organisms are uh, are not regulated. Okay, so you know you could call a you know a goldfish in the United States a goldfish and you know in another country they might call it a koi uh, two separate species okay but uh, you know two two different uh, common names and and maybe they're the same species or maybe they're two separate species they have the same common name there's lots of situations now birds are a little better because the birds have alpha numeric codes or alpha codes um, in which they the common names have gone through the international code of zoological nomenclature so the common names are standardized for birds but most other organisms they're not their scientific names are so the genus and species is uh, they are um, set okay, by the international code okay? and the way that works is here's an example so Homo sapiens, so 
you know, there's the genera, there's the species. You can abbreviate the genera, okay? um, but you cannot abbreviate the species name. Okay? Now, the genera, I would be hesitant if I were a beginning student to initially abbreviate any genera. Okay? So after you've wrote it once in a paper or something like that, then you can abbreviate it. But I would not start out abbreviating it because there are other genera that begin with an H in, in lots of different groups. Now, in the case of sapiens, we're, we're the only species that has that name. But, um, you know, if it was something else and you abbreviate it, then you could be confusing, um, you know, one genera with different species in there. Now, let's talk about naming rules. So let's say you were to try to name a species or were going to name a species. There are a few rules at which you need to know. First, the name has to be unique. Now, this one is it shouldn't be a surprise to people, but it often is a surprise when you find out that you've figured the species out, right? you've done all the work, you're going to name it, you're going to name it something, you know, beneficial to science, you're going to name it after the region where it's found or some physical feature it has, something. Um, and then you find out that, you know, Lewis and Clark actually found that species and, you know, Clark stuck his name on it. Uh, well, even if the scientific name wasn't, hadn't gone through uh, you know, an international code of zoological nomenclature because it didn't exist at the time or um, it wasn't put through, that original name sticks to that species. Um, and so that can be that can be kind of difficult for some people because if you think you have a new species but it's really not, you have to go with the old name that was given to it no matter <clears throat> no matter even if it's found in a new region or anything like that. So it must be unique. The name does. No, no other species in that same genera can have the same name. Um, these kind of things are, are important. So you really have to do a lot of research on it. The names cannot be rude. This should be, you know, a give me. But uh, you know, lots of lots of people have tried to make species names that might discredit another scientist or um, maybe discredit a a country that you know maybe suppressed the scientific community and this individual discovered a species in that country so they want to be you know showing that hey look even though you didn't allow me to get my education there here here's a name that will go down in history and you will always have that on your, you know, on your conscious as, as a society or something like that. Um, a lot of times the zoological nomenclature community, they will not allow for those to happen. They will not allow for those to go through. It is a group of scientists that check to make sure that, you know, everything's unique and that nothing's rude. And you can't name the species after yourself. Um, so, you know, you can name it after another scientist, maybe another scientist that's important to you or important to the, the research and important to the, the community for that given species, but you can't name it after yourself. I mean, um, so when you look at species like, let's say Darwinia um, is a species name and there's lots of them out there, Charles Darwin did not name that species. Okay? He, might dis he might have discovered the species and then gave the species to someone else to classify. Okay, like Richard Owen did this with the the giant ground sloth. Okay, so Darwin discovered the giant ground sloth, gave it to Richard Owens, and Richard Owens named it after Darwin. Okay, Megalodon darwinii, I think, is what it is. Um, so it can be, you can get a name a species named after you, but you can't put forth a species with your name on it. And there's lots of other rules and regulations out there that I'm not going to get into. Um, but if you eventually want to discover a species or are in the process of doing it, 
I highly suggest that you look up the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature before you even start the process because it can be a very long, difficult process at times, um, but very rewarding. I mean, to name a species is a huge deal, at least for most scientists. All right, so what's going on now from a nomenclature taxonomic point of view is the molecular approaches have just exploded. Um, it's became much easier now to look at relatedness in animals because now we're examining DNA. We're examining the building blocks of life to examine, well, is this species actually more, you know, different from this species? And you don't have to pair them up and see if they'll reproduce. You don't have to look at a bunch of morphological or physiological features. Uh, you literally can just examine their DNA. Now, is that relevant? Uh, it depends on who you talk to, because a lot of people want to say, well, where's the morphology differences also? I mean, in the field right now, if you're to pick up a species, <clears throat> you're not going to be able to genetically an analyze it. So is there a morphology difference that we can examine in the field to say, all right, this is one type of kangaroo rat, this is another type of kangaroo rat. It's based on tail length or you know ear length or coloration, something differs between these two enough that you can tell that this is one species, this is another species. Okay. Now, not always is that the case. Sometimes it's just genetics that will get two different species, and then you know we're looking at regions in which they're found. But DNA really has allowed for us to look at systematics in a great deal. Okay, nuclear mitochondrial DNA is really important for kind of differences maybe in genera, differences in species, kind of those more specific regions, more specific differences between groups that are less, um, that have been uh, separated for a shorter period of time. Ribosomal RNA is useful for examining very uh, ancestral connections. Okay, so like the connection between the three domains, or the connection between the six kingdoms. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's important to use ribosomal RNA because everything on the planet has ribosomal RNA. If you're considered a living organism on this planet, regardless of bacteria, archaea you know, fungi, animalia, plantae, protista, it doesn't matter. They all have ribosomal RNA. And so you can make those connections. You can look at those uh, relatedness between those groups. Okay, so ribosomal RNA studies, again, very important for things like domains and kingdoms. They have a very slow rate of change. Okay, this is the chunk of RNA that's going to be on the small subunit of a ribosome. It's a place where, uh, where uh, messenger RNA, sorry, is going to bind to it. And, and so it's very specific to kind of a domain in the kingdom, but it has a very slow rate of change. So it shows a lot of uh, distant evolutionary connections. <clears throat> okay, so just go over the domains real quick, just in case you missed this in, in your general biology course. Um, three main domains are recognized right now. Okay, eubacteria or true bacteria, the bacteria domain. The archaea, okay, these are um, extremophiles. Uh, these are organisms that are very similar, superficially at least, Two bacteria, single-celled organisms, no nuclei. Um, their mito or their uh, ribosomes do differ between eubacteria and archaea. Uh, archaea are typically found in extreme environments. Okay, heat vents in the ocean, uh, you know, hot springs, extreme hot springs, things like that. Uh, you know, are, are where you're going to find these archaea in eukarya. Okay, so organisms with, you know, organelles, uh, membrane-bound nuclei, uh, these kind of things are, are the main domain that we're going to be examining is, is eukarya. We will talk about these others 
just in passing, okay, or talk about, you know, endosymbiosis, like how is it that eukarya came about through the um, evolution of probably archaea, that's where most of the evidence points to, is what gave rise to eukarya, but nonetheless, most of our time will be spent on eukarya. All right. Now the other thing that we'll talk a little bit about, because it still goes on, especially at the protozoan level, but it went on early on between probably eubacteria and archaea, is this horizontal gene transfer. Because species of bacteria and extremophiles will exchange genetic material, it's difficult to build the base of a tree. Right? It's difficult to connect everything to a single ancestor because of this exchange of genetic material. Now you might say, well, yeah, other things exchange genetic material even in the animal kingdom. It's true, some animals do uh, go through um, asexual reproduction and things like that, and some protozoans go through asexual reproduction and exchange genetic material. But when you're exchanging genetic material across domains, so when you can get a bacteria and a extremophile microbe exchange genetic material, and we think that this probably happened early on, then it's very difficult to kind of build that ancestral part of the tree. So when we look at the base of the tree where the roots are, okay, this is kind of messy um, because of that potential horizontal gene transfer between the great groups that existed at this time. When we start moving up the tree, we know that eubacteria and archaea broke apart from each other. Right now, majority of the evidence suggests that the archaea line then broke from the eukarya line. Okay, so they share a common ancestor and then archaea and eubacteria share a common ancestor. Now, the other thing that is kind of difficult to work out, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about protista, is the protista lineage, there are roughly six different lineages. They all have a different kind of starting point. Um, we, all, we lump them all into one kingdom. Right now, all six of them, uh, that might change in the near future once genetics and things like that are, are more readily used uh, to work out protista. Okay? But nonetheless, these kind of phylogenetic trees or these trees of life really show a great deal of connection. So it shows that you know, protista, at least one of the lineages, kind of gave rise to the animal, animal lineage. Okay, and the fungi lineage came off of that. So animals and fungi are fairly closely related. Plants came off of another branch. And so there's some unique things, and we'll talk about this more as we progress uh, throughout the semester. All right, so the goal of systematics really is to form a monophyletic group. Okay, so like I said, the base of the tree is difficult to work out, and that bothers a lot of scientists that are systematic, systematists, in that we want to make one tree that has a single ancestral species. Okay, so that's the overarching goal, is to have one species that gave rise to others and, and on and on and on, and to be able to track it all the way back to a single ancestral species and all the descendants that came from that. Now that's that's difficult, right? Um, because a lot of times there is a lack of knowledge. So when we have to group things together, like we grouped all the protista together into one kingdom, it's really just a reflection that we don't have enough knowledge. We we have not studied it enough to find one monophyletic group. Now we grouped them all together. But, I mean, we know right now that they shouldn't all be together, okay? that it's not re reflecting a monophyletic group. Okay? Now, so you'll, 
there's some terminology that we really need to go over when we talk about cladograms or phylogenetic trees, and I'll, often I'll, I'll talk about this in more lectures when I talk about maybe revisiting a taxonomic group, I might say, well, this group is polyphyletic. Polyphyletic meaning that they have more than one ancestor, more than one ancestral line to get to that group. So when we talk about periphera and Cnidarians and Teneporas, they all have their own ancestral line, so they're not a monophyletic group. Okay, they're a polyphyletic group. Protista, they all have their own separate line classified into one group called Protista, polyphyletic group. Okay, so it's important to talk about that. Now, there's other situations where um, it's another case of insufficient knowledge, and that is that we have a paraphyletic group where not all the members are included. Okay, so it needs to be revisited. We need to bring and make it more inclusive, a more a larger grouping. Okay? Right now we might have uh, you know smaller groupings that should be all stuck together. Okay? And so sometimes you'll hear this called lumping and splitting. And so sometimes uh, scientists are called lumpers, which will stick everything together, even though they might not belong together. And then sometimes you'll hear about some scientists being splitters. And they'll split things apart with no, not enough evidence that they should be separate from each other. Okay? And that will create either a polyphyletic group or a paraphyletic group. Okay? So here's some examples of that. Again, if you look at monophyletic group, we want, as systematists, we want to take okay, all the individuals that are related to each other, connect them to a single ancestor, okay, and have one line. That's a monophyletic pairing. A polyphyletic means that you're actually looking at multiple species, but you have multiple ancestors. Okay. And paraphyletic means that some of the individuals, some of the species, or whatever classification system it is. Maybe, it, maybe you're talking about genera, family, uh, classes, whatever it might be. Some of them are not included in your grouping, okay? even though they are connected via a common ancestor. Okay. So animal evolutionary systematics. Um, the traditional approach was to look at morphology, okay? um, to just examine physical features and to look at uh, homologous traits, so traits that you could see that are connected, um, bone structures, these kind of things, and how they differed, um, how they evolved over a certain period of time. Useful. It, it really is useful. Um, it doesn't tell the entire picture most of the time, and it's difficult if those physical features are hard to distinguish. It's difficult to build those phylogenetic trees or those relationships um, between the organisms. But nonetheless, I mean, some great groupings is based mainly on physical features. So you have mammalia, okay. And that's based on physical feature of having mammary glands. Aves is based on feathers. Reptilia is based on um, watertight eggs. Amphibians are based on being a tetrapod versus Osteichthyes, which is based on bones. Having bones is bony fish. Chondrichthyes, which is cartilaginous fishes. At, so for some features, the morphological feature is perfectly fine. But when we start talking about differences in other groups, okay, sometimes it can be more difficult to just look at physical features, and we might need to bring in genetics. And, and we'll talk about this as we progress and we start examining different groups. When we start examining Moxenia or Holocephalia, okay, when we start examining them and, and the connections between them, 
Okay? We'll have to use other things than just a single physical feature. But you can see here, okay, this is a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree that's just showing you the separation by millions of years. Okay, so when did these groups okay, separate out? We know that echinoderms do not have backbones, okay, but echinoderms have the precursor to backbones. They have a hydroskeleton um, inside with some ridges, some cartilaginous ridges, okay, so they have the precursor to it. That group, at least ancestors of that group, gave rise to organisms that do have backbones. Okay, gave rise to the chordates, and then all these were chordates. They all have backbones. Okay? And so we can track that back millions of years ago to find out, well, when did these groups originate? Okay? And that's the importance of phylogenetic trees, at least one of the importance of phylogenetic trees, is to be able to look at ancestral connections. Okay? So again, like I said, the the prehistoric way to do systematics was to look purely at morphology. Now the approach is more inclusive to look at phylogenetics, um, which could also look at morphology and physiology and behavior, but it also has, uh, majority of the time, some genetic component to it. Okay, so now you're looking at homo homologs or homologous traits. Uh, you're looking at how they relate, but often you're also looking at maybe the genetics or the genes that can control for those traits. Okay. The other thing that you can look at is ancestral characteristics. So does the grouping, you know, do the members of that group have ancestral characters? Okay. Have they lost them? Okay. Um, did they originate? you know, one branch up, okay? And this allows us to look at things that we might, you know, characters that we might be lumping into the entire group and give us an idea of, well, when did that character originate? Okay? When did fish develop limbs that allowed them to bear weight, okay? At what point in time? Okay? The other thing that is nice when we look at cladograms, cladistics, phylogenetic trees, etc., is to include an outgroup. So maybe we're talking about all these things that are vertebrates. Okay? But then we need to include an outgroup. We need to include invertebrates. Okay? And maybe that's echinoderms, starfish, and sea urchins, and things like that. Maybe that's the group we choose because they're the closest to vertebrates. Okay? And then we can look at all the features that they have and see, well, look, Yes, they don't have verte vertebrae, but did they have convergent evolution? Do they have also some traits that converge, you know, between the two groups? And you can look at recently derived characters or very ancestral characters in the groups. Okay. So a derived character is basically a character that has, an, has arisen since common ancestry. Okay. And so we often call these synapomorphies, and I'll show you a, a grouping or a way to look at a phylogenetic tree and decide, well, is that a synapomorphy, is that an apomorphy, okay, what, what kind of physical feature is that? Okay. Again, phylogenetic trees and cladograms or a clade, um, they're representing the same thing. Uh, there's just kind of a different way to talk about doing the exact same thing, showing ancestral connections. Now, you can have clades, which are groupings on a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, which will show a subset of a lineage. As you might have a clade that includes species A, B, and C, and then a clade that includes D, E, and F, okay? but you have an entire phylogenetic tree. Now the nice thing about, and, and kind of one of the main differences between a phylogenetic tree and say a cladogram, is often a cladogram will depict a hypothesis. Okay? 
or a hypothetical grouping. Okay? And that's, you know, based on a monophyletic lineage, this is going to be what this grouping looks like. <clears throat> now, the hypothesis can be well supported, or in many cases, like hypotheses for research studies, it, it will be rejected. It's not, um, it's not sound enough. There's not enough evidence for it, and it would be rejected. So cladograms are typically smaller than th things like phylogenetic trees. They are showing one grouping, one monophyletic lineage, and it's testable. Okay? You think this is the connection based on these physical features or these genetic features. Now let's test it. And so it's, those are kind of useful um, in systematic studies. So here you can see... Um, a, a bunch of terminology when you're looking at cladograms, phylogenetic trees, um, and you can see we're going to go through each one of these so I can talk, talk you through what it means. Okay, So dark dots means this is a derived character. So that means the ancestor did not have that character. At least somewhere the ancestor did not have that character. So it's a characteristic that has you know evolved since ancestral connection. Ancestral traits are traits that are carried over from the ancestor, okay? and so they still remain in that group. So apomorphy <clears throat> is derived characters okay, that you do not see in the ancestor, the common ancestor between those species. So these are, would be features that are more derived. They're earlier um, or you know more recently derived characters. Plesiomorphy means that you have two different lineages, okay, but they still share the ancestral traits. At least the trait that you're looking at is still shared between those two um, branches. Okay. A topomorphy means that all the individuals except for one have these ancestral characteristics and, and the one has a derived character. So it's in some cases a topomorphy means showing that this species doesn't belong, or this group, this organism, this whatever doesn't belong in this grouping. In other cases, it's showing a you know a derived characteristic that is unique to the entire clade. Okay. Synapomorphy is a carryover from the an ancestor. So the direct ancestor derived the character, okay, and the two branches or two um, groups that came after it still maintain that derived characteristic. Homeoplasy means that you typically have derived characteristics, same derived characteristic occurring at separate times on a phylogenetic tree, a cladogram, okay, but the ancestors didn't derive at it. So homoplasia is a good example of what we call convergent evolution. So this guy came up with the same derived characteristic as this guy but they do not show a, share a direct ancestor. And so this is convergent evolution. They converged on the same physical feature or same um, physiological feature, okay? but they share no direct common ancestry. Okay? And we'll look at these again in the future. All right, phylogenetic species concept. We've talked about it before. Okay? It's different than the biological species concept in the sense that the goal, again, is to make a monophyletic connection, but you can use lots of different features, lots of different ways in which you're going to make that monophyletic connection. Okay? You can use morphology, just like biological species concept. You can use physiology. You can use more molecular evidence. Okay? You could use habitat evidence, behavioral evidence. Um, so you can use a lot of different pieces of evidence to build this connection, this uh, phylogenetic tree that shows ancestral connection. Um, and you know, it, it will point out to you the different synapomorphies, the different features that were inherited from direct ancestors. Okay? And the more robust a phylogenetic tree is, probably the more synapomorphies you're going to find on it. You're going to show those direct ancestral connections. And that's, that's the benefit of trying to get it to fit to a monophyletic grouping. 
The other thing that you can do within a phylogenetic tree or cladogram is, like we were talking about before, is you can have these clades, or what sometimes they're called hierarchical nestings. So you're nesting groups of similar synapomorphic characteristics. So you might have an ancestor that gave one characteristic to this part of the clade, an ancestor gave another characteristic to this part of the clade, an ancestor gave another characteristic to this part of the clade. So you have these clades now, okay, these groupings now, or hierarchical nestings now, that show that these organisms are more closely related. Even though they belong to the same phylogenetic tree, even though they share common ancestry, this group is more closely related than these groups, or vice versa. Okay? So here's a good example of a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram, okay, showing the vertebral or vertebrate connection, okay? So all the organisms on here are chordata, means that they have at least a nodal cord. Okay? Now, you have a whole list of things, and some of you probably don't know what some of these mean, okay? But nonetheless, we can pick out just some that are important. Say, chondrichthys. Okay? These are cartilaginous fishes, so sharks and rays. Okay? Now, how do they differ from Acteroporygii or the ray fin fishes, we can go down to the feature, okay? and you might say, well, they're made of cartilage. Well, that's not the feature that is unique. Okay? The feature that's unique between chondrichthys and Acteroporygii is that sharks do not possess lungs or swim bladders. Acteroporygii, the ray fin fishes, they, produce, they possess either a swim bladder or lungs. Then we can say, all right, well, how do the ray fin fishes differ from, say, lobe fin fishes? Okay. Lobe fin fishes have muscular lobes and ba at the bases of their appendages. So they have weight-bearing, or at least somewhat weight-bearing, limbs. So they could actually put weight on their fins okay, and kind of walk with their fins. Okay. And then from lobe fin fishes to amphibia, frogs and salamanders, what's the difference there? Okay. There's actual forelimbs. Okay. So forelimbs adapted for terrestrial locomotion. So even though this cladogram phylogenetic tree is only showing a physical feature, a single physical feature that differs, okay, the nice part about that is if you look at this feature right here, lungs or swim bladder, okay, everything up the tree from that has to have lungs or swim bladder, or you can't use that physical feature. That's how you construct a well thought out uh, cladogram or phylogenetic tree. The other things that you could do is you could stick, you know, coming off the other way, you could stick the exact or approximate year that they've been separated. So 450 million years ago, 350 million years ago, on and on and on. Okay, that will give you an idea of. When did that originate? How long ago were these groups connected? Okay, how long have they been separated, etc. All right, so with that, um, we're going to switch just a little bit and talk more about phylogenetic trees, but from a kind of a different point of view. We're going to talk about it from the actual features okay, that are important for that, for building those phylogenetic phylogenetic trees. Okay, next time.